All right, make your way back to your seats. Open your copy of God's Word and go to Matthew chapter 5. Yes, Chase is the quarterback. <laughs> Ever? Or just today? Okay, Matthew chapter 5. <laughs> Pay attention, please. Matthew chapter 5. We've been seeing a lot of the deeds that Christ did, right? Over the past few weeks, we've seen Jesus heal people. We've seen Him perform various other miracles, but really a lot of the things that He's done have been in the, in the way of meeting people's physical needs. We've seen Him change water into wine. We've seen Him heal a leper. We've seen Him heal uh, people that couldn't walk. We've seen people that were quadriplegics. We've seen Jesus heal. We've also seen Jesus meet spiritual needs. We've seen Him cast out demons. So He has power over demons. He has power over the spirit realm. He has power over the physical realm. He can make your, your physical need better. But Jesus also has power over sin. Um, Jesus has the power to forgive sins. We've seen that in the last couple of weeks. Now, this week we're going to move off from what Jesus does and focus for a little bit on what Jesus says. Okay? So we come to probably Jesus' most famous sermon... The Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus, he's being followed by... And well, look at the end of uh, chapter 4. The Bible says, And his fame... This is chapter 4, verse 24. And his fame, that's Jesus' fame, went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic... Crazy... Um, and those which had palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. So people came to see Jesus from everywhere. They heard about what he could do, and they came to see him perform his miracles. And some people, a lot of people, came to have Jesus perform a miracle for them. Because what does it say? It says they came to see Jesus because they were, and it lists off a bunch of things here. Sick people, taken with diverse diseases, lots of different kinds of diseases. People that were possessed with devils. People which were just crazy. You all have some relatives, I'm sure. Uh, I've got some relatives, okay? Crazy. They brought their crazy people to them. They brought their sick, pe sick people to them. They brought their... Uh, demon-possessed people to Jesus. And the Bible says, He healed them. Who? Like Father. this one and that one and that one. No, He healed everybody who came to Him. And so, He got to be... I don't want to use popular, although He was popular. He got to be just like crazy, way past Jersey Shore type famous, okay? Everybody knew Jesus. <laughs> so... Right. Your next door neighbor is not Jesus. No. Okay. Um, Jesus was like, I mean, he was a sensation. He was a phenomenon. And it wasn't for some kind of messed up, dysfunctional life he had had because it was on TV. They, word of mouth, got out about Jesus. He could heal you. He could make whatever's wrong better. And people flocked to him. So much so that it says, And there followed him, verse 25, Great multitudes... Great, as in bigger than big. Multitudes, as in more than one multitude. How many is in a multitude? A lot. So I guess this was a lot times a lot, and you get a lot more. So Jesus had these people just everywhere following him. Look at the beginning of uh, chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, so Jesus looks out. It's not like he was walking along with his head down and looks up and goes, huh! You know, where did these come from? So he sees them. In other words, Jesus takes notice of them. Just walking along one day, and he's just being struck by the sheer number of people that were around him. And so, he sees the multitudes, and he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now, Jesus, he sees the multitudes, and he runs up into a mountain. 
Why did he go up into a mountain? Why? Um, some might think, what? So he could project his voice somewhere so that everybody could hear him? Some have thought he was trying to get away from them. Like, they're pressing in on him, and kind of like he did a couple weeks ago when he pushed out in a, in a boat, and they were on the shore so he could get away from them a little bit. It probably had a little bit to do with that, but he wasn't running away from them. He was getting a better vantage point. He was getting a stage. Because this wasn't like Mount Everest, all right? If you look and you see the, the Sermon on the Mount, the, the actual spot that Jesus taught from, um, I've seen videos of the place. It's really what we would consider just a really big hill, okay? But it was, it was an elevated place, like and a, a place that's just plains like Israel is, they call it a mountain, okay? So Jesus went up the side of this, of this elevated place, and he got himself a vantage point, and he got where he could speak to the crowd. And this begins what is Jesus' most famous sermon. And this sermon goes on for three chapters. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, it ends, chapter 8, verse 1. Because um, if you notice, if you have a Bible, anybody got a Bible that has Jesus' words in red? Okay, let me, let me see this. Check this out. This whole page, and this is small type right here, okay? So we have five, we have all the way through six, and then all the way through seven down here to chapter eight, and that's where Jesus ends. So Jesus spends a little bit of time here talking. When you consider the fact that one chapter of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John can have a lot of different events in Jesus' life, can have a lot of different cities that he traveled to. <laughs> so, when you think about the fact that one chapter, I was just thinking about this earlier, one chapter of any of these books can have a lot of, a lot of time in it, and they took three chapters for this one sermon. That tells me two things. One, there's some pretty important stuff in this sermon. And two, Jesus probably liked to preach for a long time. Be glad I'm not Jesus, okay? Because my sermons don't take up three chapters. I don't care who's writing. So, how many matter of fact, do they I've been talking a lot about how y'all should be glad I'm not Jesus for so many reasons, okay? If I could make people get struck by lightning, I'm just saying. Okay, so Jesus opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, now let's look at the text of the sermon that Jesus preaches to them. So Jesus, he winds up and he lets fly with this, uh, this sermon that is recorded for us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the first thing he says, anybody, what's the first red word there? What's the first Blessed. red word? Blessed. He goes off on what we call the Beatitudes. Those of you that went to junior camp, uh, they, they had... The, the little B on the shirt, right? I've slapped K in the B a couple of times. And he wore it, and I like just, there's a B on your chest, and like smacked uh, him. That one? And I think he hates me now. But um, that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't think he's big enough to beat me up yet. So, um, I am. <laughs> I am almost so old that I can't run away, but we're, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So they, they went all through the Beatitudes. Now, check this out. The Beatitudes are simply. The, the first part of Jesus' sermon here, when he says, Blessed are these people, blessed are those people, blessed are those people, blessed are... And he talks about the people that are blessed or blessed. Now, this was strange to the Jewish culture. Now, those of us like me that have grown up in church and we've heard the Beatitudes all their lives. And to you don't think about the fact when you're, when you're like me and you grew up from age 10... I lived in the home of someone who was the pastor of a church, okay? Before that, I lived in the home of a person who worked at a church. And before he worked at a church, it didn't matter what was going on. We were at church. So I have spent my life, literally, the first Sunday that I was born, I was at church. I can probably count on one hand the amount of church services that I've missed in my adult life. So, it's pretty safe to say I'm a church person, okay? I'm just that, whether, I'm, uh, whether I work at a church or not, I'm, I'm going to church, okay? I spent a couple of years working for other companies, but when, whenever church came, 
didn't matter what was going on, me and my family were going to church. So people like me, we, we see these things like beatitudes, hear a word like beatitudes, and it, it's no big deal. I've heard it all my life, literally all my life, I've heard stuff like this. And you say that word to someone who's never looked at a Bible before, and by the way, the word beatitude is not in here. Okay? Not in the Bible. Um, it's what they ended up calling them later. So, you say that word to someone who's never been to a church before, and they say, be what kind of attitude? Um, what's wrong with my attitude? Why well, I have to be your attitude? I, I don't even know what you're talking about. And so the word be attitude, you're, you're going, what? What you got, Kay? I can't hear you way back there. Yeah, he's, he's invisible. Um, the, the word beatitude comes from... Okay, let, let me just read this so I don't get it wrong. The word beatitude, the where it came from, since it's not in the Bible, the word beatitude comes from the Latin word, which means blessed. It means beatus. or it, The word is beatus. And so they called it the beatitude. Beatitude came from the word that starts all of the beatitudes, which is? Blessed. Blessed. So it's talking about the people that are blessed. So that word beatitude, that's a little strange, but this was a little bit strange for more than one reason. Because the culture that Jesus was talking to right now, Jesus is standing up on the side of a hill preaching to these people, and the first word he says is a word that they don't usually use. They don't say, I'm so blessed today. They don't say, uh, that they don't say bless you when somebody sneezes. They don't, they don't bless their food. They don't use the word bless unless they're talking about God or talking about someone that's in the presence of God. This is a divine word to them. It has to do with God, the place where God lives, or the people that are in God's presence. They didn't talk about people on earth being blessed. Why? Because, and you know, I'm just going to give you my opinion here, but... Uh, Life is hard. It's hard, to fit. it's hard to look around. It's hard to read news stories and think, man, this world is just blessed. Because you read about, I mean... Murders. Murders, accidental shootings, people that are just hateful, crime, all kinds of different things. You read about uh, the places in just our country, in our state, or even around the world that are just depraved. They're off the wall. They're whacked. And people are doing horrible things. Sometimes it's not even malicious. Sometimes it's not even on purpose. There was a nine-year-old girl out in Texas that shot and killed her gun instructor. What? In a firearms accident. She was being trained to safely use the gun and killed the guy that was training her. I don't know. I haven't read that part of the story yet. It just happened. There's all kinds of stuff in this world that when you look at it, you're not going, well, we're just blessed to be here. That firearms instructor was so blessed today. Okay, you're not thinking that. You're thinking, if you, if you look at some of these, focus, if you're looking at some of these news stories or news tickers where they have all kinds of different stories on it, you're reading down that, you're not thinking, man, what a blessing. You're thinking, that's messed up. Right? So, Jesus sits here and looks at them and He starts to tell them who is blessed, basically like straight from God, on a heavenly level, this kind of blessings on these people. And look what He says. He starts off, says, uh, four categories of these blessings, okay? First category He gives is for who these blessings are to. And these are, these are the attitudes that people should have, okay? He lists four categories of attitudes that people should have to obtain these blessings, okay? Now, stay with me for a second. Listen to this. The, the things that he's about to say, blessed are these people, blessed are those people, blessed are those people. These are people that have a certain type of attitude toward something or someone. The first category he gives is our attitude toward ourselves. Jesus describes here four attitudes which should be in our lives. The first attitude is toward ourselves. And that attitude is humility. Look what he says. In, uh, in verse 3, 
He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus says the poor in spirit, what He's talking about is humility. He's talking about the quality of being humble. Okay? Let me tell you what this does not mean. This does not mean some kind of fake put on, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not this, I'm not that. This is not uh, a false humility. This is... Um, what this humility is referring to is a correct estimation of one's self. That means assessing your abilities, your talents, what you are and what you are not correctly. Okay? That means not overstating the things that are good and understating the things that are bad. That means accurately defining yourself to others. Let me, let me see if I can... Uh, put this in perspective for you. I played basketball in high school with one certain gentleman who he was he was a legend in his own mind. He was the greatest player he had ever met before. He had he he was not a starter. Okay? He sat on the bench until coach got bored with us being in there or until coach until we were beating the other team so bad that he would let this guy play. So this kid, he would come off the bench, wasn't good enough to be a starter, and one day he's, we're playing or, or practicing or whatever, and he tells us that he is like a 75% three-point shooter. He, out of every four shots he takes from behind the three-point line, he makes three of them. For those of you that don't know, that's really good. NBA players don't usually shoot 75%. That's really high. That's great. And just, I'm telling you right now, the kid was probably not less like 75 and more like 17. Okay? He was not that good. But in his mind, oh, and you know what he said to me? I said, dude, you, let's look at the book. So we went and we looked at the shots he took and the shots he, he made and the shots he missed. He really was down under 20%. He didn't make that many. And so when I pointed this out to him, you know what he says? Oh, I wasn't trying on those. What? He was a legend in his own mind. You know what he was doing? He was, he was overestimating the good and underestimating the bad. He didn't have a proper estimation of himself. He didn't have a proper understanding of who he was, what his talents were, and how good he was at using them. What he was doing was the opposite of humility. That's called having an ego. That's called being arrogant. And what the Bible is telling us here is we are to stay away from arrogance. We're to stay away from even the other side of that, going away from arrogance. We're, st we're to stay away from a false humility. When you run to the other end of that, that's like saying, I'm not good at anything. I can't do anything. Well, you know what? My Bible says that if we will trust Christ, we can do anything He wants us to do. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. How do we accomplish things? By stop relying on ourselves and start relying on Him. Stop trusting our own intellect. Start trusting His plan. We, we t stay away from two things. In order to be poor in spirit, in order to have this humility, we stay away from arrogance and false humility. Okay? So that's the first attitude that should be in every Christian's life for this blessing that Jesus is talking about. Um, and that's humility. We should have that humility about us. The second, the second category of attitude is our attitude towards sin. Our attitude towards sin should be one of righteousness. We should want righteousness. Look at what the Bible says. Uh, verse, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, the Bible talks about three different things here. Mourning, meekness, and hunger. Okay? So you mourn. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is the Bible saying? Is it mourning? That's talking about something that's dead, right? Someone dies, and now you're sad. You go into mourning. Uh, you have a chihuahua that kicked the bucket, so you bury it in the backyard. Everybody dresses in black. You have the preacher come out, say a little eulogy, and you bury the dog. Okay, that's not the kind of mourning that the Bible's talking about here. That's not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about is echoed by the Apostle Paul when he writes to the church. The Apostle Paul says, 
that he dies to sin every day. So the idea of mourning here is the idea of death to sin, to our own desires, dying to ourselves. So when we put away our flesh, when we put away the wicked things that we naturally want to do, then we are focused more on righteousness. That's the attitude that we should have in our lives. The attitude towards sin is we should be dead to sin. The attitude toward righteousness is we should want what's right. Next verse, he talks about being meek. Blessed are the meek. Now, when, when popular psychology defines meekness, they're usually talking about the kind of person who can't stand up for themselves. They're usually talking about uh, someone who has no backbone, someone who's just, well, okay. They, they just go along with whatever anybody else wants to do. This is, a, this is how they see a meek person. What meekness is not, okay? Stop. What meekness is not, meekness is not being weak. Meekness is not allowing yourself to be walked over by everybody. Meekness is knowing what's right, sticking to it firmly, fervently. One, a po one popular definition is meekness as being power that's under control. When... There are two kinds of things that don't do anything good. There's no power at all, and there's too much power that can't be used. Let me give you an example. My father has a, uh, a little blue uh, Ford Ranger over there. That thing has about negative six horsepower. Okay, it is the weakest truck in the entire world. I, you can't, I mean, just towing that trailer in there, unloaded, that trailer is almost too much for it. The thing is so weak that you can't, it, you can't pull out in traffic because somebody is going to run you over. You have to wait until you can't see a thing coming on 19 before you can go or risk having someone honking and sticking their arm out the window at you. Right? With a finger. That's not enough power. That truck is anemic. It is so infuriating to drive. But sometimes you just need a truck, so you gotta, you got to use it. So... The other end of that spectrum is my father has a 1990 Mustang GT that has a V8 and a 5-speed. I love this car. Where is that? Um, Where is that? It's at my house. Can you, like, drive it one day? Um, so, on the one hand, he has, and they're, they're almost the same color, the truck and the Mustang. you got the truck that can't get out of its own way. you got the Mustang that can pull like 16 of the trucks. So it, the Mustang is fun, the truck is not. So the truck, as far as power goes, if you really got to get somewhere in a hurry, truck, car, truck, car, not the truck. Okay, you're anything. Get on a bike. You're not going to take the truck if you got to get there fast. Get on rollerblades. I don't care. Segway. You're going to get there faster. So not having enough power, not having enough strength is useless. Can we agree on this? Yes. Yes? Not being strong enough is not good. So the other end of that spectrum is having too much so that you can't control it. Um, and a lot of people talk about having strength or power or energy. Strength, power, energy, if there is not a mechanism to use it, something that can control it, then it's completely useless. It'll be lost. Right. Um, in, oh, I don't know, the mid-40s sometime, about 45, 46, America, we gave a lot of energy to Japan. Twice. They were called the little boy and the fat man. Yeah. They were atomic bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We gave them energy. Here's what happened. Gave them too much Listen, energy. when that's what they named the bombs. Okay, check it out. What did that energy do to Japan? Kill people. It killed people, knocked down houses, leveled the entire city. Why? Because we didn't exactly give them a way to use the energy. There was nothing to harness it. There was nothing, no mechanism in place to use the energy. Right? Right. Another example is the sun. We had a 1990-something Kia Sophia. 
horrible car. And the dashboard on that car, Mount from it. sitting out in the sun, it started to warp and get all lumpy and it lost its color. I mean, you could look at the door panels and they were a completely different color than the dashboard. Why? Because the sun cooked it. The sun misshaped everything, broke certain parts of it, it cracked it. It was nasty. Why? Because the sun took its energy and put it into the dashboard. And the dashboard didn't know how to use it. You take that same energy from the sun and bake a solar panel with it, and you can run certain parts of your house. You can charge a battery. You can, there are even certain cars that their sunroof, and a lot of them have a very big sunroof, and they collect solar energy and run vents to cool the car while you're in, inside shopping. Yep. That's awesome. My dashboard and my junky little Kia couldn't do that. Because my car was always just sweating hot whenever I got in. The kind where you get in, you grab the seatbelt, and it burns itself like a brand into your hand. <laughs> so, having Christians, in order to have meekness, in order to behave in a meek sort of way, we need to have power. Not having enough power is still bad. But we need to have control over ourselves or we're out of control. When we lose control, that's not meekness. That doesn't honor God. It doesn't bring glory to His name. And it's not a good testimony. We need to have meekness, which is taking the power, the strength of God in our lives and controlling it. Using what He's given to us for His glory. Okay, so that's, that's meekness. That's um, our attitude, part of our attitude towards sin. Controlling that which God has given to us. Power under control. Um, and finally, he says in verse 6, uh, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I love this. Because I'm a food guy. Okay? I love good food. I don't really like bad food so much. So when people take leaves off a tree and cook them in a pot and say, It's greens! Like, no. No. <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian. I'm a meditarian. Go cook a cow. Give it to me. I'm good with that. So, by the way, meditarian, not a word. Okay, don't go using that. Um, so, I'm a food guy. Okay, you with me? I love good food. I love to eat. And I love, like, um, I love all you can eat kind of stuff. I love going to those Japanese steakhouses where they cook it in front of you. Oh, yeah. I don't even care about this show. I don't care that the guy's sitting there spinning spatulas and knives around and throwing an egg and catching it in his hat. I don't care. I'm like, dude, give me the food. The food is fantastic. I love it. So, here's, here's what I like. Check this out. When, when you like, when you have breakfast, you know that for dinner that night, you're going to the Japanese steakhouse, and I'm going to freaking okie-size this, all right? Give me extra everything. So I skip lunch, right? No, I'm, I haven't eaten since 8 in the morning. It's like 7.30 at night. Safe to say, big dude's hungry, okay? And I'm extra disturbed with the show tonight because I'm hungry. Like, skip the, the fancy stuff, big boy. Put it on the plate. So... When the food comes, oh, it's party time, it's right? Gone. I'm double fisting it. I, I go with the chopsticks, right? My wife can't understand that because she can't use chopsticks. But here's how you use chopsticks on rice. For those of you who don't know, you just like put your arm around it and just start scooping. <laughs> just throw the stuff in your mouth. It's good. So when I'm starving like that and I finally get the food on my plate, guess what? It's gone. Now I'm happy. There is nothing better to a starving person than being filled. With food. Than finally getting the nourishment that they've been dying for. Um, so whenever I, you know, I skip that meal and I'm waiting for the, the big party in my stomach tonight. That rat meal. I'm, whenever I finally leave that place and my plate is completely empty, and my wife's plate, what was left over hers, is completely empty, and I have completely cleaned off my kids' plates too, <laughs> and I sit back, and I'm like, oh, that ah. no, Think about this. The, the idea here, listen to this, 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The idea here is sort of, get the picture in your mind. Someone who's been lost in the desert is absolutely famished, dying, literally dying for some water. Someone who cannot survive without water. How good is that water when they finally get it? When they are able to fill themselves and rehydrate themselves with that water. Nothing in the world, when they've crawled out of the desert and they finally get that drink of water, to them there is nothing better in the world than being able to fill themselves, hydrate themselves with that water. You understand what I'm talking about? That's the idea of the hunger and thirst here. I cannot live without this. So when... This is God's promise to us right here. When you desire, when you desperately want the truth of God's Word that way, when you desperately want righteousness the way someone would if they were absolutely dying if they don't get a drink of water, if that's how bad you want to be right with God, to do right things, if when that's how bad you want to be like Christ, you will be filled. You, your desire will be quenched. What you want will be granted when we want what God wants. When, you, when your desires, when your lifestyle, when what you want aligns with what God wants, then the Bible promises you will have that desire filled. You will be filled like the person that desperately needs the, the drink of water. Real quickly, that's how we relate to sin. We relate to sin. Our attitude towards sin needs to be one of righteousness. And real quick here, our attitude towards the Lord needs to be one of relationship. Real quick, uh, verse 7, 8, and 9. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, check this out. Merciful. Starts off with merciful. Blessed are the people that are merciful. Why? Because to be merciful, that is to give someone, to, or to not give someone something they do deserve. Like, John's been mouthy all day, he deserves a butt kicking, and I don't. That's probably true. Right? So, John, I don't kick your butt. Right? That, that's merciful of me. Act like you know what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. yes. John agrees with me. So... <laughs> Mercy is not giving someone something they deserve. God has been merciful to every single one of us in offering forgiveness to us. Check this out. Mercy is a core attribute of God. It is one of the things that makes God who He is. So why would that be blessed when we show mercy to others? Because that is an attribute of God that we can show. That is something that belongs to God that we can have. That we can live out and give to other people. Something that God gave to us that we can in turn give to others. When they annoy the junk out of us, we can be merciful. When they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, we can show mercy. When someone desperately deserves exactly what we want to give them, we can show mercy. Because that is a core attribute of God. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Who are they going to get mercy from? God. They're going to get it from God. Uh, God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Does this mean if your heart is pure, God's going to stand, come out and stand right in front of you? No. Yeah. No, this means when your heart and your intentions and your motives are pure, when you desire what God wants, and you're chasing hard after doing what God wants you to do, then you're going to see God, and others are going to see God in you. You're going to see God when you look in the mirror because your desires, your motives, your heart is pure. Okay? Um, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When we make peace with others. Now, there there are lots of people that talk about a religion of peace. But literally, Jesus Christ, throughout the scriptures, we never see him hurt a single person. He's the prince of peace. He's peaceful. And he calls his people to be peaceful. And those are the ones that he will treat as his family. Um, the The last word that Christ gives here is how we should behave toward the world. 
Look at what he says in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So when you're faithful to God, here's what Jesus is saying. When you follow me, I promise people are going to dislike you. Some people are going to dislike you so much, and he's looking square at his disciples right now. Okay? You can just picture him looking at his disciples because I'm going to tell you this, every single one of his 12 disciples was killed for following Christ. Every single one of them was what we were called martyred because they followed Jesus. So he's looking at him in the face saying, you know what, you, if you follow me, if you're faithful to follow me and do what's right and do as I say, guess what, you are going to have people hate you and you 12 are going to have people kill you because you followed me. They say, okay. Guess what, people? We live in a country where nobody is going to kill you because of your religion. You don't have to worry that, uh, that someone's going to come from the government and arrest you for being a Christian. It might come down the road, but it's not right now. So right now, what should we do? We should follow Christ and not be ashamed. When that time comes and you can be arrested for being a Christian, what should we do? Follow Christ and not be ashamed. Why? Because blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Now, Jesus said, if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. But you know what? That heavenly, that divine word, blessing, that's what's going to be with you. That's what's going to get you through those times. That's what's going to keep you going is I'm with you and I will bless you. Too many of us, and y'all, I'm talking to you and me right now. Too many of us, this is us. When people look at us, they cannot tell we have ever heard anything from the Bible. They cannot tell that we are supposed to be Christians. We couldn't be convicted of being a Christian if we were tried for it. We need to... We need to live like Jesus says we'll get those blessings for us. We need to live that way. Our attitudes, those four attitudes toward, toward ourselves, toward the Lord, toward the world around us, toward everything we do, needs to be exactly that. We need to desire righteousness. We need to want to be like Christ. We need to be faithful even if other people don't like us for it. And yet we get so intimidated, we get so scared that somebody's going to laugh at us. When Jesus' disciples weren't scared when people were swinging swords at them, when, we're, when people were tying them to posts and lighting them on fire, when people were crucifying them. I think I'd take the laughter. Yeah, nobody likes being laughed at. Nobody likes being hated. But you don't have to worry about being persecuted. So what are we so stinking afraid of? Why is it so difficult to just be like Christ? To just determine, I am going to do what's right no matter what. I am going to follow Him. I want what I want to be exactly what He wants. Alright? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for the day. Thank You that You are so good to us. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody in here that doesn't know You as their Savior... They've never taken that first step in a relationship with you and they've never asked you to forgive their sins. Come into their heart. Be their Savior. God, I pray that they would do that before they leave this place tonight. God, help us as we walk out these doors to live a life of worship, to live a life that looks like you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great rest of the week at school. Behave. Be good. I know that's the same thing, but please do.